Well, um, now we're going to begin the um, 45 minutes. Boy, we're on t we're on time, and there's a barbecue for lunch. So, um, who said the end game is bad <laughs> or going to be unpleasant? And and uh, so, Professor, thank you. We discussed uh, silver gold arbitrage, for short, bimetallic arbitrage, as one of the most promising strategies which we can uh, develop in on these very dangerous waters we are trying to navigate now. I, I This is the best we can offer and if you tie it in with the basis, the concept of basis, then uh, I think you are doing very well. There's one question which I would like to ask Tom. In fact, we discussed this a couple of years ago already, but now in view of the present crisis, you see here there are two bases to consider the gold and silver, and we would like to make one indicator of the two which will guide our bimetallic arbitrage. Now one idea is to take the difference of these two bases and the other is to take the ratio. And there might be others, but these are the two first two which come to mind. In other words, the problem is to create one indicator when we have two and we uh, don't want to give any advantage to one at the expense of the other. So what do we do? How could we develop an indicator which will give us the clues in this bimetallic arbitrage strategy? Well, I think uh, those two methods are, I think, both uh, valid ways of doing it, and there's advantages and disadvantages, I think, to each one. Um, when you look at the absolute difference between the two sets, uh, I find that it's sometimes much harder to find meaningful sort of movements um, if you're trying to chart, uh, because when you when you talk when we talk about one indicator, this is a this is a value that you should be able to chart over time and determine you know what the, where the trend is, or as we showed yesterday, the zigzag pattern of it uh, may indicate where you might buy or sell. Um, ideally, Tom. Uh, she says it's hard to hear down there. It, okay, sorry. Um, so, so that's that's one part of it. But I think the the, the uh, um, taking the absolute difference is probably going to give you the most sort of accurate picture, um, because when you take the ratio, um, you can have when both are, are relatively small as they are now, uh, you end up having these massive spikes. And I, I was showing some people during the break this chart that I've done, and I think that demonstrates that maybe at some point here today, I could. Unfortunately, I don't have a projector, but I can try to recreate the chart up here on, on, on the tablet, and and it's sort of you know to indicate exactly what what this does. But um, so, so it almost becomes both. hypersensitive. You are you are tracking both. Right, right, and I think there's different 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 uses for both. But I think I, I notice more the potential for a change when I use the ratio because it's more sensitive. But when I'm trying to track trends it's much better to use the absolute difference because it doesn't tend to change by as much or fluctuate by as much so it's a smoother sort of uh, transition from you know um, one level to another level. So the difference is for one purpose is, suits one purpose better and the ratio suits another purpose better. And I will demonstrate this also as part oh, of you the will. service, right? When? In, in the service or now? That's correct. Do um, you want to add to this? Well, I don't, I don't have with me. I only, I only brought no. one of them. But uh, uh, I can put up the one for uh, the ratio, which I think is, is, is more useful for directional change um, hmm. or, or sort of topping. Um, um, and then I can do that maybe a little bit later. Um, yeah, but well, as part of the service, I'll have both sets of charts up, and and it'll be, I think, pretty clear uh, what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, as you see, we don't have uh, the last answer to all the questions. We are in the process of developing these tools, but it seems to me that the super sensitivity of the ratio approach might have 
some purpose because those extreme spikes might want to tell us something but we are still not in the position to understand the signal but it, it should mean something I mean a big spike um, so so this is really a fascinating thing and it's an ongoing thing and uh, I guess we just have to wait for the further results to come out. You know, there are questions, so let's... Oh, there wasn't a question, just a point. Um, that um, really the thing that we should be focusing on is, is the change in trend. So, so you've got these, not, not the ratio, but actually when the ratio yeah. changes from decreasing to increasing, like they're going to be the pivotal points all, all the other way around. Correct. I mean, and this is the, the chart that I have that I've been showing some people. It, it demonstrates that somewhat. Maybe if we have time at the end of this section, I can go up to the board and sort of draw out this chart. All right. All right. So. Okay. Well, so this is one thing which I wanted to add to what I had to say this morning. The other, and I already indicated that this is a problem and we have to discuss it is uh, where do you take your clues if you have that approach I discussed that we have two accumulation strategies combined and consider it as an arbitrage perhaps this is stretching the meaning of the word too much but I for the purposes I am using it, it, it uh, was satisfactory. In other words, when we abstain from selling, it is a buying, call it synthetic buying. And we, when we abstain from buying, it is synthetic selling. So, in other words, you never sell in the strict sense of the word selling. You substitute for selling. And that boils down to two accumulation accounts, gold and silver. So then the question arises, what is the guiding star of this? And obviously there is a choice again we face here. Either you use the Silver, since this question is not settled yet and may not be settled for some time, that is to say how to combine the two bases to give us just one indicator, let's assume that we have these two indicators, the gold bases and the silver bases, and uh, the question then is which of the two we'll choose as our guiding star. Shall we take our clues from the gold bases or ignore the gold bases? And, uh, I can only make suggestions here because really a large part of the answer depends on your circumstances. In other words, just how much silver and how much gold you have to begin with. Because you could just visualize this thing. Okay, assuming that the bimetallic ratio is covering the range between 15 at the low end and 100 at the high, if we start <coughs> out from the 100, ideally we might have 0% silver in the accumulation account and 100% gold. And as we go down and the bimetallic ratio approaches the lower end of 15, then will be 100% silver and 0% gold. And in between, you can just uh, uh, have an interpolation, the regular thing, how this varies. But you see, that's not very realistic because you are never 100% in gold, 0% in silver, or vice versa. You are always somewhere. So, and d different participants have different levels of accumulation. 
and uh, and therefore it's it's uh, it's not possible to give an answer which will uh, fit all sizes. Uh, so I am trying to suggest that if you are a strong believer in this theory that the bimetallic ratio is going to go down and will hit the extreme low level of 15 as historically it was for hundreds of years at that level 15, if you strongly believe that this is what is happening then you should use the silver basis as an indicator so in other words, you, you have two charts now. One is the silver basis chart and the gold basis chart. And you are watching for peaks in the silver basis chart and this will uh, prompt your, your buying. Buying what? Well, when the silver basis chart peaks, or uh, you assume it does peak, because this uh, point yesterday was a very valid one, but it, we don't uh, know that it peaks until it does peak. <laughs> and uh, we may uh, misinterpret the situation. Well, the answer is that w when we think it peaks, we should, we should buy the silver. In other words, don't buy gold when the silver basis peaks. Buy the silver. And, and uh, um, when, the, uh, when the gold, when the gold uh, basis peaks, then you buy the gold and not buy the silver. So uh, this is the situation which you face if you are a strong believer in that, uh, that silver has a lot of catching up to do because uh, if we are say between 70 and 80 on the bimetallic ratio this means that silver is is uh, is very cheap and it's going to have to catch up with gold. has a lot of catching up to do. Now if you are not so strong in that belief then you may modify that approach uh, accordingly and, uh, and that means that you start with, with uh, uh, that you are assuming that uh, the accumulated gold which you have in your account is already answering your needs more. Let me call your attention to the danger in, in, in that approach. When, when I am recommending bimetallic arbitrage I am firmly on the theory that silver is a monetary metal which is now neglected relatively speaking to gold and it has a catching up to do. Could I be wrong in this? I could because nobody can answer the question to what extent is silver an industrial metal? Well we know it's an, also an industrial metal and it's more of an industrial metal than gold is. We do know that. And we also know that as such silver is vulnerable to a very deep depression if that's what is going to happen. And think of the 1930s the depression when silver dropped from say for, for the sake of ground numbers 
one dollar and twenty five cents in uh, in uh, eighteen seventy three by nineteen thirty two it dropped to twenty five cents which is an eighty percent drop in value and and why did it drop that much well it did drop that much because by ninth by nineteen thirty uh, silver was very heavily involved in industrial applications and in fact the monetary silver was dumped uh, onto the industrial silver market and uh, when the industrial uses dried up then silver suffered. Could this be repeated in in our time, there is no definite answer to that. And if, if you think of platinum, then you might just see the danger. Just a few days ago, platinum dropped almost $1,000 an ounce. And why was that? Because the uh, industrial applications, which is mainly catalytic converter for car production, uh, were threatening with uh, uh, elimination of demand. Uh, new car production is falling, uh, people are driving less, but uh, it could turn back and it, so in other words, platinum which a lot of people would like to use as a substitute for, for or even something that can beat gold and silver as a monetary metal is so much exposed to industries to the drying up of industrial applications that it would shatter any kind of reasonable uh, strategy investment strategy. So I made my own position very clear to you already yesterday and the day before that I do not consider platinum as a monetary metal period. It's not. It has never been. They tried to uh, promote it as a, met a monetary metal and it didn't succeed. Platinum coins in circulation never reach the saturation point that that uh, you could really call it a circulation. Now silver has similar uh, problems to the problems which uh, were threatening the platinum uh, market and any kind of strategy involving investment in platinum because silver also has uh, very important industrial uh, and other applications even in medicine silver has important applications so I would be out of my depth if I tried to give you a categorical answer like I was confident enough to give you about platinum I I am not able to do that for silver. I just have to leave a margin of error. I f tend to feel that silver is still an industrial metal. In fact, it's coming back and will be more and more important. This is something which was missing in the 1930s. There was no nothing in the horizon showing that the monetary system is about to collapse when there will be a tremendous upsurge uh, of demand for monetary metals. Uh, and, and therefore uh, silver suffered as it did falling to one-fifth of its original value, tremendous erosion of value, because there was no expectation anywhere that silver may make a, an early comeback as monetary metal. But this is different today, and that's why we are talking about the silver canary in the gold mine. 
if it wasn't true, then uh, silver couldn't give you an indication what's going on in the gold market. But now, I think this is a different thing. So if you compare the depression of the 1930s with the depression which I believe is unfolding right now, which could be even deeper and more devastating than the earlier depression of the 1930s, then this is a very important difference between the two. Perhaps there are more similarities than uh, differences, but this difference is extremely important and never forget it, namely that this depression of ours in the 21st century is also involved with the collapse of the international monetary system which will uh, certainly make silver a comeback kid. Silver will reoccupy its former important position as a monetary metal. And perhaps this will be dramatic. It will, could be almost from one day to the next. We don't know how it will happen. I, uh, I ridicule Ted Butler in many ways, but when he talks about this explosive interest in silver, which he expects to happen to the extent that the price of silver will be four digit before you notice it, uh, I I am not laughing at this, I am only laughing at the reasoning. He says it's because silver is so scarce. I, I, my explanation is different. Silver is sufficiently abundant that it could reassert itself as a monetary metal and when and if it does then there will be this, uh, this very spectacular um, uh, increase in the demand for silver, which could, of course, uh, mean a precipitous drop in the bimetallic ratio towards the uh, 15 level, which means <coughs> gold will be f only 15 times as valuable as silver, as opposed to what it may be today, say 70 times as valuable. So this is a warning on my part. We, we just don't have enough information and we, don't, we are not in the position to predict how people will behave under the various stresses which come with this depression. To predict that silver as an industrial metal will not be hurt or would the monetary application of silver compensate for this? We, we just have to allow for a hefty margin of error. I gave you my own view. I believe that silver is, has a, is a very strong candidate to reassert itself as a monetary metal, which means that this aspect of uh, falling value as an industrial metal is not going to be dominant. It, it may of course confuse the issue and it may, the, may make the basis more volatile than it would otherwise, otherwise be, but basically it's the fact that silver is reasserting itself. That's my own view. And it's subject to change. There have been so many surprises during the past few months that I, I have to give it to you with a grain of salt. Okay, Professor, I just wanted to make the point. Have you seen the um, articles on the net about how the Mexican government is trying to um, silver back their currency? It's not the government, is it? It's, there's, it's there's a private. A in, in Mexico. It's a private organization led by uh, Hugo Salinas Price. And, uh, to me, that's a canary in the gold mine. It's a forewarning of things. Yeah, and the latest uh, developments in Mexico are also very interesting, because uh, Mr. 
uh, Salinas uh, had, a, had an agreement with the Central Bank of Mexico. It's the Central Bank of Mexico which has the authority to produce these Libertad coins. It's, there is no independent mint, it's the Bank of Mexico. So all these coins, Libertad coins, are produced on account of the, the Central Bank in Mexico. And there was a commitment that they would uh, continue producing these coins through thick and thin. And uh, the Bank of Mexico broke that commitment. The same thing what happened in, in the United States, the U.S. Mint closed shop and said, we, sorry, we, we are not supplying the market for the time being with uh, buffalo coins and this and that, eagle coins. The same thing happened in, in Mexico in spite of that commitment and agreement. So they actually broke. In the United States, I'm not aware if there was a firm agreement. Probably there wasn't. But in Mexico, there was. And the central bank broke that agreement. And just think of the explanation they gave for that. The explanation was that we need the silver. See, Mexico is number one silver producing country in the whole world. So the silver mines are working at full capacity producing. The explanation is that we have a very large foreign order for silver which we want to fill. <laughs> so the citizens of Mexico are out of luck. <laughs> Tough luck to you. You are a Mexican. We have to, uh, we have to serve the foreign uh, customer. Whoever this mystery customer is, you, you can just guess. It's probably another government. I don't know. You know, this is a, I just want to interject this here because it falls into the, the phone call I received shortly before this thing. You know, this world is filled with phone calls and rumors and... <laughs> this is not a rumor. I, no, I understand. I, I, I understand. I understand. This is a fact that this the fact. that the, uh, the the government of Mexico has abrogated its agreement with the, the, the central, with bank. central bank. The central bank, same thing, really. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, yeah, with to produce these coins as as they had, and what your statement was quite interesting because it triggered the phone call that I heard right right before I came. In fact, it, it came in re response to knowing that somebody from the Perth Mint was here. It has to do with supply and demand of the world market. And that a large that the excuse given here by the Mexican Central Bank that they have uh, ceased, uh, they're not going to produce these in, in the quantity that they said they were going to, because of a order of a large foreign buyer. The phone call, the rumor that I heard, uh, the unconfirmed rumor was that the U.S. government has placed a large, large forward order on the gold market in, in a gold contract. The United States government, which prints paper like, like it's paper. <laughs> all right, and it, and, and it is. But they may be, and there's a rumor flowing because all it is is that they may have placed a large forward contract on, on the gold, and we don't know. What do you mean by place, though? To yeah, buy. exactly. I know to buy, to buy, to buy. And, and it, 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 gold. I heard gold, but that's only. And you don't know who's going to take the other side of that, you know, or where is this coming from? Seller. Yeah, who's a seller, or is it maybe an internal thing of trying to control and uncontrol a situation that is headed towards the uncontrollable? <laughs> you know, I mean, we don't know. But the, the excuse given by the Mexico Central Bank is, is in that direction. So, um, But there's the other side is that is a possibility, it's a two-edged two sword of where those holding the silver, which is Mexico, as opposed to the United States and gold, it is, an, it is possibly an increasing commodity. They know the pressure at the retail market that it's building. And they, as, as, as uh, the professor said before, if he had a gold mine, he would just sit on it. You know, he would cap the, you know, you know give the guys a, a you know, subsistence salary to go home, or the miners, and wait around for the day it becomes really valuable.
rather than you know or it off and sell it you know blah 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 into the market to, for your short term profit. So we have all these factors going on now, uh, the partly rumor, partly fact, and who knows the reason why. But we are indefinitely in an interesting period of time. So with that, we, you know. Uh, professor, you did mention that recent developments in various countries uh, surprises you. Perhaps you can list a few of what, those. What developments? She was saying the, these developments that are just happening around us oh. are surprising you with their either rapidity or the occurrence of the nature themselves. And she would like, Judy would like to know, what is this that's causing you to be surprised? These what events? The Mexico one, <coughs> yeah, the it's one, one, of yeah. course. Well. Uh, the greatest surprise to me was that the exhaustion of sources of silver may be more serious and more advanced than I thought it was. And um, if that is the case, then I think I have to modify my previous estimate that we have another two years for the uh, monetary system to limp along and it could be less than that if if the signals from the silver market are true and also the gold market because what we don't know is that I think right now uh, trading is business as usual as far as the 400 ounce international gold bar is concerned Less so in the last couple of weeks, maybe, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So in other words, we still have uh, contango if we measure bases. Smaller on one now, though. Oh, smaller. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but anyhow, the point is that would the retail market pull the wholesale market down and, and the bases uh, could go into permanent backwardation as far as also the 400 ounce international bar is concerned or can the sheer weight of that wholesale market pull back the retail market so gold coins will start flowing again well, we don't know, but it's certainly a very unusual sign which we have to indicate that perhaps the permanent backwardation is imminent. Well, not imminent in the sense of tomorrow or a couple of weeks from now, <coughs> but certainly less than what I allowed, two years. That's, that's the way I look at it. I have a little comment. Well, we, okay. well, we have a comment. Oh, yeah, question over there, please. Um, professor, um, it would be fair to say that the government entities and the central banks are aware of how dire they put themselves into, and <laughs> that is it possible that they're getting their house in order as we speak and preparing to open their mints back to silver and gold? And is it likely that a creditor nation would be the first to do so, or a debtor nation would be the first to do so. And how would that affect the dynamics of the world? Good question. That was an excellent question. I, he was asking, I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is that um, we are moving towards a situation where the central banks and the governments of the world are realizing that we're, we're reaching a critical phase of the crisis. And that, given that, that it may it be a possibility that they are even considering opening their mints once again to the uh, minting of gold and silver, opening their mints to gold and silver. And if this were in fact a possibility, in your opinion, would you think it would be a debtor nation or a creditor nation <laughs> that would have the greatest incentive to do so? Mm -hmm. If you answer this, I'll save myself ninety dollars. Don't. Answer in Hungarian. Yeah, answer in Hungarian. Oh, very good, Tom. <laughs> what? 
I'll understand. All right. <laughs> yeah, he speaks Hungarian also. <laughs> That's good time. <laughs> All right. Uh, I I don't see any sign that the governments and central banks are ready to open the mint to gold and silver or both. There is just no sign. In fact, I believe that they would try everything, even the craziest idea, to avoid that, you see. However, in, in doing this, they expose themselves to a danger, and the danger is that a, a small country, uh, maybe even a rogue country... Somalia. <laughs> The, the last card. The Republic of Congo. Said, yeah, Congo. Yeah. Or Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. <laughs> Zimbabwe. <laughs> the last card. <laughs> but more realistically, I would say a, a, a Muslim country could open the mint to gold and silver. In fact, in Malaysia, there was a Mahathiri proposed the scheme to bring back the gold dinar and the silver dirham. But they did not talk about opening the mint. Mm. They just thought that once a coin is created, then there's a unit of account, and there will be an interest for firms and governments to bill uh, deliveries of oil or this or that in gold Iran. This is naive. This is utterly naive to believe that. What you have to do is you have to make uh, dinar, gold dinar, and the silver dirham available for circulation. And there's no other way of doing that but opening the mint to gold and silver. So anybody from anywhere in the world who brings the right amount and the right fineness of gold and silver to the mint can make the exchange no charge for minting. This is absolutely necessary because you've got to reach that saturation point I was talking about. You have to have enough coins available so that no longer will pay people take coins and put in cookie jars because that's a nice, nice scarce coin and hope for numismatic premium or this or that. And once the saturation point is reached, the coin will start circulating. Basically, those people who spend the coin have a reasonable expectation that they can replace it. You see, the commitment of that government, whether it's Malaysia or Iran or this or that, is strong enough that they will maintain, they will keep the mint open, come thick or thin. They have to have this commitment, and when people at large are convinced that this is a serious commitment, then the uh, gold and silver coin will start circulating, and once that happens, people will start billing their deliveries in terms of these coins. But not before. I mean, whether you are buying or selling, you can't expose yourself to the dangers of a violent change in the, uh, in the ASIO of, uh, of these coins. And to stabilize that ASIO, to stabilize that the, the value, the commercial value of these coins, it's absolutely necessary that people should be assured that if they spend the coin they'll be able to replace it because they can always take gold and silver to the mint and make the conversion. So uh, my answer is that uh, there is no sign that enough wisdom obtains in the U.S. Treasury or anywhere in Western Europe, including Australia, I guess, because Australia would be in a marvelous position to open the mint 
to go, at least Except to go. I have a fool's forbidden. <laughs> I'm also because yeah. of the gross manipulation of yeah. these two yeah. No country would dare to do they, that. They would be thrown out. They would. But but Muslim countries could could but still there is manipulation. It's huge. If the market price goes up, the coin goes out of circulation. The oh. government sells it at one yeah. price. Market goes up the next day. The coin is out of circulation. I I, uh, I don't see it that way. If there's a firm commitment, yes. then at one price, at a single yeah. price. The no price, no, no, no. no price. Just that's the beauty. Just a that, coin. That's the beauty. You take gold and you turn it into coins. You take uh, your own gold. But if you are a miner, you take new gold. If you are an ordinary citizen, you take old jewelry or what have you. Jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so then the price will be what? The price will be determined by the inflation. No price. Price becomes irrelevant. No price. You just take your gold and get the coins back. It's just a unit of coins. Yeah, but then what does it buy you tomorrow, today? Whatever. 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 Whatever
<laughs> silver plated products, which probably is several billion ounces right there. But don't you think that? Uh, so, uh, sorry. It, so, so I think that you have to consider that, Nathan. You know, so it's not only how much there is in total, but how long it's going to take to get it back into. It. My, my personal idea is that is that there is a bottleneck, and perhaps the professor may not agree, but I think there's a bottleneck to how much silver physically can be converted on an annual basis. Let's say, even if production was ramped up by a huge amount, I don't think you can really convert that much silver back. So, um, so you're saying that actually makes it harder for silver to retain and to re reassert itself in the long term. I think, I think it's, it, it, will, it would happen over a period of time, whereas I think gold would be much more immediate. I think there's very, very large stocks of gold sitting in bar form. Of course, there's quite a bit of jewelry too, but most jewelry, I think if you own gold jewelry, you know pretty much where it is. and. Uh, um, and so it's, 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 it's right in front of you. Where silver, you know, you can have silver, uh, silver trinket, you've got a little bit of silver here and there, so it's, 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 a, it's a different process. But in total, I would say there's something in the order of, let's say, four to five billion ounces of gold worldwide and maybe 20 billion ounces of silver. So that, might, that right there might, if all of it was re returned, which is obviously not going to be the case, but if all of it was turned into a monetary form, that might imply maybe a ratio of five to one. Um, that's not going to uh, well. That's okay. not going to happen. But I think that. Um, so, but but so you got to look at sort of what the what the transition would be. I don't think we're going to get to the point where it's going to be based on sort of how much gold and silver is available. Is, is, yeah. is, uh, is available. It's going to be based on people's expectations. Absolutely. Of how yeah. much more Absolutely. silver is going to be turned into. And how firm the commitment, commitment is. That, and yeah. how much well, how much are people willing to turn these ornamental forms of silver, which is where most of silver is held, which was purchased at usually at a, a large you know premium to sort of what the melt value would be. Um, so you'd have to sort of have a much higher movement in the price of silver, and it would, may take longer to do that. Um, so I don't think this that's why I don't this 15 to 1 ratio to me is yeah. it, it's an indicator, but I don't you know will it return to that? Well, for one, I think that the uh, the ratio between gold and silver and, and recoverable gold and silver in the Earth's crust is like eight to one. Yeah. So the fifteen to one never even, even uh, just it was, it was a local, it was arbitrary to some extent. Mm -hmm. right. um, and I think in the future, though, it's probably going to be less for some reason because of the industrial um, supply. Um, but I think, but unlike unlike gold, where a lot of it will be collected right off the bat. There will be silver sort of coming back in over time, and people looking at it saying, oh, there's more silver, there's more silver, but there's not more gold. So I think it's going to be people's expectations of eventually how much is going to come back that's going to control the ratio and not what's currently circulating. Could I just make one comment? Do you know how much gold, I mean silver, does the Chinese government in stock? Nobody no knows. knows. No, correct. No one knows. It might be quite much, a lot. But I know roughly how much was produced. Yeah, but that's the, the, the professor was speculating that it might be quite a lot. Right. It was a circulating currency in China for it centuries. It was quite some time. Centuries. Uh, I was, was told curved. they were still using it quite a Well, but they weighed. I mean, the Chinese used it. It was a tail. tail. Used they used, yeah, the Chinese understood I'll talk, it. I'll talk to you. Okay, yeah. as a basis. You know, that's all I'm saying here. Yes. <laughs> The previous session, uh, why gold and silver haven't gone into backwardation in spite of the crisis, well, I have a, well, I have a set of thoughts. One is that money, because of the crisis, money is very scarce at the moment. And so interest rates have gone up. That could be a possible reason why people aren't going to gold and silver. I know in the Middle East, Okay. in the Middle East, money is scarce. A lot of interest rates have gone up because the dollar shot up as well. And that's one reason why people sold gold and silver rather than bought. Otherwise, the expectation Could was they're going to buy true. in the face of this crisis. It's true. That's a, that's a possibility. There's, you know, there's. A, I would just like to add something here that uh, a couple of years ago, Franklin uh, Saunders, uh, Sanders, um, who's a silver guy, uh, wrote a paper, and and in it he talked about the the uh, he was holding the silver position that there's going to be a much greater appreciation in silver than there is going to be in gold, but as a as a premise, he said that essentially. We don't know what the availability of gold and silver, even the ratios to each other are. And, and he even posited that this, they're equal. But he said there are people who consider it v differently. But, you know, for that, and, and then there was another paper that was just recently put out by Dave Morgan, the silver guy, another silver guy, who pointed out that silver is essentially, that's coming to market, is essentially a byproduct of industrial mining. And that if this is because we're seeing a collapse in commodity demand, you're going to see a collapse in the availability of silver coming to market. 
And we also know that in, in mining terms, pure mining terms, that there's been a, a situation that people call peak gold. That, that, that the, all the major deposits of gold, like oil, were discovered a couple of decades ago. Nothing has come on that, we, that would look like to replace it. And, it. and even if it does, it takes a long time to develop these mines. So if you're, you're talking about the supply, on the supply side, these, these are the factors that we're talking about. And I think the most volatile thing is not the supply side. The supply, the, what's volatile is now the demand side. All right, and we're in an incredible state of flux of where, and that's why I think when the when the professors pointed out that it may be the thousand ounce bars of silver, the you know the, the different bars of gold, the, and this is the point that you brought up in a conversation I had with you, Tom, before the, the, before this conference, is that we're seeing a fragmentation of the market. We're seeing very very strong retail demand, but what Tom believes is that what's when we're going to see real backwardization. The sign of real backwardization is when the institutional money, when the serious money, when the real, when the paper boys start moving into that realization that this is they're being cut off, and that hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. And 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 in fact, when I, on the way here this morning, I heard Judy talking about that, and I think we've heard it a lot before. Is that the difference between a recession? And a depression is a recession is when your neighbor loses his job. And a depression is when you lose your job. But I want to add the difference between this depression and the, dep and the last depression was it may have been true that the difference before was when your neighbor lost his job is a recession. And when you lost your job, it was a depression. What I want to point out here is that what's going to make this different is when the central banker loses his job. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll happen. <laughs> so. Uh, about Nathan's comment. The uh, monetary legislation in 1793 or whenever in the United States uh, was not well thought out because it established by metallism. Please don't make the mistake. The US Constitution did not establish by metallism. It established the fact that both silver and gold were monetary metals and the mint should be open to both. But it did not establish a statutory price between gold and silver. That's a very important point that it's the legislation which made that mistake. So the Constitution need not be changed. It's, it's a marvelous document, pristine document, no mistakes. The legislation, it was a mistake to uh, establish a statutory price for, uh, for exchange, the bimetallic exchange rate. So, um, going back to the question itself, I think we are in reasonable agreement here that uh, silver is going to play an increasingly important monetary role. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I, I have a slight disagreement with Tom that uh, I don't see this as a concentration of silver if or gold. If the mint, any mint in the world, could be a small country, opens the mint to gold and silver. This does not mean a concentration of gold because the silver and gold will go back to the original owner. Well, I, I didn't say concent. I, I, I didn't mean concentration in the sense that it's concentrating the physical holdings of it. I meant that it's a choke point through which Gold and silver must pass. Yeah. So it, it, there's only a certain size. Well, I think that it can be, you have to convert price. it at a certain rate, and, and, and silver is more difficult to convert. I think what would happen. And it's, there's more quantities to convert. Uh, 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 you see, it goes back to people's faith in the strength of the commitment of the government to carry on. Because if people think that this is not a very firm commitment, it's subject to uh, withdrawal, or 
tinkering at the edges, then it's not going to happen. But if people think that the commitment is firm enough, come thick or thin, then the market will develop clearing instruments. So even if the amount of physical silver coins and physical gold coins is not large enough to carry a huge world trade on its shoulders, there will be clearing instruments which will uh, make it possible to an increasing world trade to be financed by a slowly growing silver and gold coin circulation. So that, um, I, I don't think this choking point is, well, obviously it plays some role, but I don't think it would be able to prevent that to happen. Well, I, yeah, I don't agree with that. It won't prevent it, but it may delay the... But what you're saying is that, but you're saying that people will know how much silver is going to come back into circulation and set a ratio based on that. I'm saying there's going to be expectations that people may have, and it's going to be different based on who you are. Hmm. And let the free market decide that. Hmm. But uh, uh, you can't say it's going to be 15 to one or eight to one. No, 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 no. So, no, no. So to put any sort of it arbitrary won't be a number fixed. or based on what it was in the past. It that was on my only argument. And it won't be fixed. It won't be fixed and it may not be 15. It could be five. It could be 50. It could yeah, be but, uh, whatever. I mean, it's but whatever it is, it, it may time. not last. So it's yeah, immaterial. It, it would turnover. Yeah, it would no number. No yeah. single number is important anymore. Because Agreed. Agreed. Well, yeah. we, we are just talking about a range between 15 and 100, but uh, but we are not suggesting that 15 is important other than being an extreme That's right. in a historical range. Right. Okay, totally. we're very centuries, good. Get, we're for centuries, mankind has always had this one to ten ratio between gold and silver. Well, yeah, we're we're reaching a, a point here of lunch. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't go with silver. <laughs> and um, so, um, so we'll, continue. we'll continue this. Uh, at, in fact, what is it? I say two hours? So we'll give the traditional. Yeah, half past two. All right. Thank you.